you sure you don't want to have any more children? Uh, he was pretty set on the idea that he didn't want any children. Uh, you know, conversations where she was trying to catch him in a lie or trying to catch him saying something that would implicate him. By January 5th, 2003, divers started searching the marina where Scott was at that uh, Christmas Eve. My goodness, it is so hard to do everything with my left hand. Sorry, there is so much background noise. I'm trying to turn the pages that I had written. <laughs> now, Scott had the receipt from the marina, remember? And they believed that he had something to do with her disappearance and that what if he took her body and dumped it in the water. They continued to ask, you know, Lacey's family, do you think that Scott had something to do with this? And they would say, no, you wouldn't. Twelve days went by and nobody, no new evidence. But then, something else happened to make him look so much worse. I mean, listen, he looked terrible by now. But hold on, it's gonna get better. And better, it's a way of saying, it's an expression, but really it's gonna turn so bad for him right now. Because authorities in San Luis Obispo, which by the way, it is stunning. There's a donut place by the beach. I don't remember where. It's like a, um, it's like an Asian store with donuts. So good. Anyways, back to the case. Um, authorities in San Luis Obispo were looking into Scott. You're wondering why, right? I mean, the guy can't catch a break. They were connecting him to the disappearance of Kristen Smart. This happened seven years before Lacey disappeared. So hold it right there. But this was a murder that happened during Scott's uh, college years. And things keep moving and I feel like it's another aftershock. But right now it's just my dog. Sorry for the long pause, didn't mean to do that, but um, they were checking on Scott's schedule to see if they crossed paths, you know, if they had any class together, if they had classes by each other. So, just picture the media, if you were not there to hear this at the time, or, you know, it's, picture the media, they went crazy. Is this a serial killer? Uh, you know, maybe this guy is just killing girls for a sport. But after a while, they checked everything and there was no link found. So I hope somebody leaked that because if the authorities made some kind of a press release saying that they were looking into this guy while they were looking into him for his wife's disappearance, I mean, that would have been something that they could have avoided and avoided the circus media, uh, media circus. Yeah, I have a Spanish brain today. So on January 6, 2003, Scott had a conversation with Amber over the phone again where she is pushing hard now and she's saying, you know, my friend, Saki, uh, she's worried about me because, and she's scared and, um, and in the conversation, he almost seems like, oh, that's weird. But what did she say? What is she worried about? And Okay, uh, it almost seemed like she was fishing for information and it almost seemed like he was not, he really wanted to know what she knew at that point, but didn't want to open his mouth. But then he asked, have you been watching the news? And she says, Amber says, no, I haven't. Even though she knows everything, she's got 
wasn't traveling, I wasn't in Europe. The girl, okay, this is literal, okay? The girl I'm married to, she disappeared on Christmas Eve. Guys, if my husband refers to me like the girl is married to, we're gonna have a problem. Gosh, really? I mean, how? Oh, listen, that was not the, the girl that you are married to. That's your wife. You just gotta spit it out. And I guess that's a common thing. I do it too. Um, you know, I, um, when I don't wanna say something like, say I use other words so I get the guy I get why he did it but it sounded so terrible as a woman as a wife as I th that was so disrespectful and so uh, machiavellic like so well thought out that at that point he lost even points in my scale in, in my eyes now she's very particular about this okay because she's trying to catch him on a lie so in a lie so he's, she says something like remember December, December 9th you told me that this was going to be your first holidays without your wife and that she was dead Remember, you were crying and broken. Were you predicting her disappearance? Almost like... I'm gonna throw it out there and see if you bite. But here's the kicker. I mean, the worried husband hired a lawyer. I can't remember if his first name, McAllister, is the last name. Three days after Lacey disappeared, remember when the dad said, yeah, I don't think that the uh, polygraph is such a great idea. Let's get you a lawyer. So the police continued to record Amber's and Scott's conversations. And now it it's kind of thrown out of the table the idea that maybe he was calling just to check and see what she knew because now, because now she knows so why did he keep calling her you got me there I have no idea I don't know what he was thinking so that thought that people initially had in the back of their mind that Scott was hiding the mistress and that Scott was afraid that people knew about this and he was checking up an amber just so she wouldn't open up her mouth. Now it seems like he was trying to keep a relationship over the phone with this girl. Okay. The lawyer, Scott's lawyer, launched his own investigation. And he hired this PI guy who was apparently a great it's great at uh, what he does. Um, and he talked to different witnesses that place Lacey on that road that takes her to the park where she was going to walk the dog while Scott was at the marina. Remember that he said that he left the home at around 9.48 a.m. on December 24th. That he went to the warehouse, that he believed that uh, Lacey left home sometime after that to go walk the dog down Covina Avenue. That leads to that park where she was going. Now I'm going to talk about those witnesses that I mentioned in the beginning that were not used in court. And then you take a 
saying I hope she doesn't fall because again she was struggling with this dog then they also had another witness Tony Fr Freitas who worked for a bread company and was driving in that truck the company's truck when he sees a young woman that is pregnant and she was walking a dog that 
would say that they saw Lacey. They're sure it was Lacey. They know it was her. They know it was her dog. We got it. The computer place is Scott's in one place. His phone puts him in the, uh, that place too. And Lacey's in another place. So it's impossible. It's impossible that Scott killed her on the 23rd. And then on the 24th, she was walking around the dog. And it's impossible that he did something to her because she was walking the dog as he was at the warehouse. If this, in fact, was strong evidence, and believe me, these witnesses went in camera and gave their reports, but something must have been off. They either couldn't 100% say this was lazy, or something was not adding up because it was never used in court. And let's say that the police didn't want to pay attention because they wanted to convict Scott. Yeah, that's a valid, you know, assumption. But why the lawyer was the one who paid the PI to go get this information and now the lawyer says, yeah, never mind, not going to use that. Something doesn't add up. So somebody is lying. Somebody. Because it was in the best interest of Scott and it was in the best interest of the lawyer to use that information. And he deliberately said, we're not using that. Sadly, I don't know why. I wish that he, he said something like, well, they're not sure. That's why we can't use that in court. Uh, or, you know, maybe they didn't describe the clothes that she was wearing properly. You know, you get me. Something was off. Now, Amber kept with her recordings and everything with Scott. But the police found out that the National Enquirer, wow, I mean, out of every media outlet, the National Enquirer, okay, the, the tabloids got a hold of a picture or a series of pictures where Amber is with Scott in a Christmas party that same year, 2002. They knew exactly when they were going to run the story, so they had a timeline very, very short period of time to go and talk to the family, both families, before this got out. And they did go and talk to the family. Um, they were like, you know, they had an affair. This is what's going to happen. They showed the pictures to them. But they never said, oh, we know Amber, she's helping us catch him on a lie. No, they never said that, because they're not dumb. All they said is, well, we know he had a mistress, and some pictures aren't going to come out. <sighs> At the time that they told that to Lacey's mom, her reaction in her what she said at that moment was, why did he have to kill her? Now the tables are turned, and Lacey's family, who never believed that Scott had anything to do with Lacey's disappearance, now they believe that he did. On January 24th, 2003, exactly one month after Lacey's disappearance, there was a big press conference and everyone was there. And this sweet looking girl is there with a statement that the police wrote for her, where she says, My name is Amber Frey. having a relationship with Scott and I didn't know he was married basically in a few words 
she was emotional, she was crying, she was asking for forgiveness, you know, she was so sorry to Lacey's family. Lacey's family started thinking, what, what else is he lying about? Volunteers felt the betrayed. Um, the media ran with it, so they felt like stupid because... They were helping this helpless father looking for his wife and son and now all of a sudden he is not who he says he is. And he is having an affair and they do not have the perfect marriage. So all those fears of coming out of this thing are com becoming a reality. Now he's going through the judgment of people because he was unfaithful to his wife. Was he hiding his wife's murder? Or was he hiding the girlfriend? Some people took one side. Well, let me put it this way. 97% of people thought he did it. He killed her. Next. But there was that 3% that were lying. He didn't want this to come out. On January 25th, 2003, in another call that Scott has with Amber, again, Scott doesn't know that she is cooperating with the police, but he calls her and asks, did you call the police? She says, no, I didn't. The media was parked outside of my work and my business, and I, I just couldn't uh, ignore it. He said, I mean, this was just so hard to hear. Uh, I mean, what a cycle. He said, I am so proud of you. You have an amazing character. When I heard that you were crying, I had to pull over and throw up. He was in his car. He was listening to the radio. I don't believe him. I mean, gosh, this guy lies so much that even the simpler things, you don't know if you should believe him or not. Amazing character. Are you freaking kidding me right now? Amazing character. Because she didn't throw garbage at him. She couldn't. Otherwise, you would know she was not wanting to keep this relationship with him and probably working with the police. He said, you know, I've decided that I'm going to talk to the media now, probably on Thursday, and I want maximum coverage of what I'm going to say. So he set up four separate interviews with local and national He said that the point of that was to keep the attention on Lacey and not in his inappropriate behavior. In one of the interviews, you know, the local ones were at his house and the, the, the national ones, of course, he had to go to these different shows. But he was facing some of the brightest minds in the media that talk about this kind of for a living. His lawyer told him, don't do it. Don't do it, Scott. It's going to be bad for you. He said that he told the police about Amber in the first night when Lacey disappeared. Total lie. He said, we have a perfect marriage. Don't worry about it. We're doing fine. Somebody took Lacey, basically. He also um, said that he told Lacey he was having an affair. He told her at the beginning of December. And that Lacey was okay. <laughs> I remember clearly Nancy Grace were like, Okay, so you mean to tell 
his brother ID. Was he running away? Was he going to Mexico? But again, I'm going to play devil's advocate and say that's where his family was. That's where he was staying. They happened to live by the border. They happened to go to this golf course, you know, since they live there. And, uh, you know, apparently the money was not even his. The brother took it out. Something about an account. There was a good explanation of why he had the money in cash on him. so he could get in and get a discount at the golfing place. When they ask him why he um, changed his appearance, grew a beard and uh, dyed it blonde and dyed his hair blonde, he said that he wanted to hide from the media, that he was being looked after every second of his day and he got his appearance to kind of escape the media. He had his brother's ID because he was wanting to get into the, the golf course that day and he would have a discount. And he had the money because something <clears throat> they explained, okay, it makes sense. He had a reason for everything. But still, just didn't buy it either. Um, he was staying in a maximum security prison waiting for his trial. According to the charges, it was intentional. It was premeditated murder of Lacey and Connor. Lacey's family was grieving and just to look at the press releases and, you know, the interviews, it breaks my heart. It makes me tear up and, and I just feel so bad for that family. And every family, but I don't know the, the brokenness that they felt and the disbelief that somebody would want to get rid of Lacey and a baby that it was about to be born. they were talking about going for the death penalty I mean if anybody deserves death penalty is a murder a proven murder that kill his wife and unborn child I mean I'm sorry but that that's kind of the definition of why the death penalty is available Scott's uh, lawyer said no I'm out. Listen, you can't afford it. I don't have the team. You need to find somebody else who can represent you. And if you don't have the money, go to a public defender. But uh, Scott's dad said, let's hire this guy, Mark Gurgos, which is a guy that was in the media talking about the case. And you know, in those shows that talk about true crime and cases like this, there's always a good guy and a bad guy. And this happened to be the guy that would try to make people believe that maybe Scott was not a murderer. So they contacted this lawyer that worked on TV. Can Rammer remember the name of the show? Larry. Sorry, he worked in that show. I'm pretty sure you know who he is. Uh, and basically, he was going to represent the most hated man in America. The, he was not new to the media. The guy, I mean, worked on TV. He knew how to work around those things. So they decided to hire him. They had to, I mean, a lot of things because this guy 
said a million dollars. This lawyer also hired somebody that was going to go to Modesto and immerse himself in everything that they got there. This other lawyer name is Matt, Matt Dalton and he I mean <laughs> he had 30,000 pages on documents that were going to have to go through during trial. This guy also, this lawyer Matt Dalton he spent, and this is according to him in one of the interviews I watched over a hundred hours in prison with him talking and going over the case. Mr. Dalton described Scott Peterson as not a monster. And he said that he even told Scott if she slipped, if she fell, if this was an accident, we can go for manslaughter, just say it, and we can turn things around. And Scott would say, but I didn't do it, and that didn't happen. The police theory at that point is that actually Scott killed Lacey the night before on December the 23rd, and that he, everything that he said that happened on the 24th, Lacey eating cereal, watching Martha Stewart, him living, she was leaving with the dog. They believe that he set that up. Like, he let the dog out with the leash and the dog wandered and then came back to the house. They believe that nothing that he said that happened on the 24th happened. They also believe that they, he attached eight pounds of anchors to each of her limbs and another one around her neck. Basically, sink her in the water. They also believe that he dumped the body in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay, I should say. But the PI that was initially investigated said that he found some witnesses with names and last names that, you know, could testify and say that they saw Scott there at the marina that he did in fact bought that parking ticket uh, permit thing for the day at 12.54 that he parked his car after launching the boat in the water that he got in and the witness doesn't remember the face of the guy that went in the boat so I guess that's why they didn't use the guy but he recognized the, the boat and he also said that he couldn't see anything inside the boat and he looked Scott in his uh, statement said that he made it to Brooks Island and to a shallow area and he stayed there to fish for a little bit when he checked the time it was time to go home so he decided to go back that witness that said that saw a guy in that boat, but he wasn't sure it was Scott, said that, well, he left to Puerto Vallarta, and that's where, you know, he contacted the PI and said, if you need me to testify, I'll go. But the lawyer said that they didn't need that, and he moved on. Yeah, I guess. I guess they, they work with people that are guilty and they can tell. 
knows more than I do about reading people's emotions and stuff like that, but is there a possibility that when he saw the baby's body, he realized what he did? I guess that's a possibility, too. On May 4th, 2003, uh, it was Lacey's memorial, and, you know, she, she was also, it was also her birthday. They made a big celebration. Lacey didn't want anybody crying. She used to say that all the time. I don't want people crying on my funeral. I want everyone to celebrate my life. And the Petersons were not invited, so they gathered and went to where Scott was being held at and they had 20 minutes of ceremony where they were able to hug him, be close to him and um, basically mourn in their own way but I thought to myself what were they mourning? I mean, yes, of course the Lacey's death and the grandchild and, you know, of course that, but I wonder what, what they were thinking. Is it possible that they undoubtedly believed that he didn't do it? Is it because Scott is Scott and he was never violent, he was never known to do anything, you know, illegal or Or is it because, you know, he's my brother, he's my brother-in-law, he's my son, he's my... I don't blame the Rojas for not wanting the Petersons to participate. I, I can't even imagine the way that they must feel about the family in general. this point there's nothing that really points hard strong physical evidence that shows that Scott did it but there's a lot of circumstantial that it's making him look like a horrible murderer and that any jury would be happy to put him behind bars up until this point so I hope that you join me for part 3 where we're gonna go through a lot more details and things that popped up in court and things that were not discussed commonly in the, the media at the time but were later on learned of and shared during the trial so please join me next week for part 3 on this series if you missed part 1 there will be a link with part 1 on the top of the screen and if you're watching this in the future, feel free to check out the playlist that will be down below. I'd like to know what you think up until this point. Do you have any, any doubts? Do you believe he did it? Or do you believe that there is another possibility? I have my mind honestly. After all this research and everything that I learned about this case, I have my mind made up. But it's after I learn all the details and that is what you're missing. The last details of this series. <sighs> Such a horrible case. I can't even imagine what the family must have gone. Oh my goodness. I mean, losing a child, but losing a child and your grandson, it must be horrible. Learning how terrible their last moments in this earth were. I have no words to describe what I think that must be, that must, must be like or must feel like. Such a necessary death. Not that death is necessary in any case, but such pointless marriage when you, you know, it's something that I can't stress it enough. You do not love your wife. You do not love your husband. You don't want to try hard. You don't want to work things.
this out. Leave. Leave. The worst thing that can happen is financially your credit goes to Yeah. 
you know, Shanann and Chris Watts and how Shanann was so outspoken and so out there and she carried the pants and she was so, you know, and Chris was so, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And, you know, and then all of a sudden you see that guy, that sweet guy, that sweet husband going crazy and killing an entire family. For goodness sake, say something, say something, and do something, because if you feel like that person is going to keep you trapped, just leave. Grab a couple of underwear pieces, a couple of socks, and start over in the East Coast, or in the West Coast, or in Mexico, or in Spain. Such there's always a way out. There's always a way out. I've been saying this for as long as I've been here. But now we find these things, common problems in marriages that for some people are so over the top that they need to do something 